putting, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna get started by putting the, I, I, first of all, I'm Kate Knuth. I'm the um, managing and research director for the 100% campaign and your cruise director for the evening. Um, so just gonna be um, helping move us along through our pretty ambitious agenda here this evening um, for getting a sense of where we are in the legislative session and what's in play. Um, so I'm gonna just put in the chat right here, uh, our goals for the evening. Wanna give you first an update on a climate budget landscape at this moment in session. We're at a really important moment in session. Aurora will tell you a little bit more about why and what that means. Um, and then we're gonna go deeper on some key areas for uh, a climate budget, particularly um, looking at transportation, at resilience and at um, financing and funding. Their sort of by design is not like specifically focused on some of the energy things. Those are super important, um, but there's only so much you can put in one uh, in one evening. So um, excited to go deeper. And then really importantly, I, I've asked every panelist if they have a way for you to take action. They're going to share that in the chat, make uh, an ask for you to take action to advocate at this moment um, uh, for various climate investments. So um, that's the goal. Those are the goals for the evening. And then I am going to put um, the, uh, oh, wait, that's not the right document. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to put the agenda for the evening in the chat just so folks can follow along um, since we don't have uh, uh, power, a PowerPoint or presentation. Hi, Janet. Nice to see you virtually. Um, coming in from southeast part of the state, Driftless area, lovely. Um, so agenda, I'm welcoming you now. I uh, will be moderating the evening. Um, then an overview of what's happening and where we're at. And we'll have Aurora from the 100% campaign helping us with that. Um, then transportation, resilience, uh, financing and funding. Sorry, I did not take the times off that one. But basically, I'm thinking about 15 minutes for the overview at the beginning, and then about <clears throat> 20 minutes for each section, and then a quick wrap up. So really like trying to get you some really straightforward information about what's going on now and then ways to take action um, uh, in the days and weeks that we have left in the session. So um, I'm gonna start with Aurora. It's you're, you're up. Um, Aurora Vatran is the legislative and political director for the 100% campaign. Um, the way I think of her is she's like our superstar on the ground person at the Capitol day by day at committees, talking to legislators, connecting folks. So really, if you want to know what's happening in the moment, any given time, she is a great person um, to be connected with. So we're excited to have her um, here tonight and mm. wanted to first... Um, just ask if you're welcome to introduce yourself as well, Aurora, but I just want to give people a little background of where your information is coming from, literally like on the ground with, you know, minute by minute things that are changing at the legislature at this time of year. Um, but wanted to give you first just a chance to give people kind of an overview of the moment that we're in in session and what that what that means for kind of the pieces that are moving to help frame up the rest of the conversation. Definitely. Um, thank you, Kate, for all of those nice things. I feel like I have to uh, really live up to that description now and uh, pretend to be knowledgeable. Um, mostly, I am just like around and ask a lot of questions <laughs> and uh, share as much information as I can with the other folks who are working on good stuff. But um, I appreciate you and thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Aurora Vatran. I'm the legislative and political director for the 100% campaign. I know, I think most of you, um, and it's lovely to see you. Um, I'm going to just do a little bit of like context of uh, where we're at in this session and like how it holds up in history um, to kick us off. So um we have a trifecta, obviously, um, which is wonderful and it's not news, um, but it is like helpful context in like recentering and regrounding us, right? So um, we've had a trifecta before. Um, this isn't the first time it's happened. Um, we have a surplus. 
we've had surpluses before. I don't think that they've ever been this big. Um, and those two pieces are like really important when we're thinking about um, what the next six weeks of session um, is going to look like, but also all that we've accomplished um, previous to uh, where we're at yeah. right now. So um, I think, um, and I had the data points on it pre uh, spring break and I don't have them anymore, but this is literally the most productive session ever. Like we have passed more things and have had more things signed into law to date as any other se session in our history. Like it's a big deal. And I think particularly as we're moving into this like really fast pace um, part of session where um, things are moving really quickly, deals are being made, things are like being uh, negotiated and like brought in or left out. And I think um, it's important for me, particularly, I had this moment today where um, there was an amendment that um, I didn't like on a bill that I care a lot about. And I was like, oh, this sucks. I'm so mad about it. And also like, we are doing really, really important historic things. So not that we shouldn't be like fighting as hard as we can to get the best stuff possible. Um, but I think it is also important to recognize um, yeah. all like, all that is possible, all that we've already done. And like that we have laid a foundation to like have sessions like this in the future where like, to me, this is the start, right? Like we've passed historic climate legislation already this session. Um, we will do more of it like before session is over. And then we still like this technical biennium isn't even over yet, right? So like we are at the starting point of something that is much bigger um, and much more uh, impactful for our state. Um, that's super. That's super helpful to get that kind of global, like high level, the you know the various majorities and people in the seats to pass really powerful state budget, a budget surplus um, that we can invest in really key ways. And I and and like just a very productive legislature in terms of passing policy, like kind of jaw dropping, never unprecedented uh, for folks who followed along at the Capitol a lot. So I want to dig, dig in a little bit to help people understand the, the moment we're in, in terms of like, you know, hundred percent events can, can air to the slightly nerdy side, which we embrace. And this evening is no different. Um, so can you help us like dig in on the specific moment we're in, in terms of developing and passing the state budget? Yes. Yeah. So um, we are six weeks. This is our sixth week. So we're like less than six weeks to the end of session. Um, we had our third deadline right before spring break, um, which means that most of, if not all of the legislation, um, that will end up being signed into law, like already exists out in the world, right? Like it's already been introduced, authored. It's already had hearings, um, there will be things that are changed or like maybe a couple of like surprise things that pop up. But for the large part, like if it is going to happen this session, it is out in the world somewhere, um, which is really exciting and also like a very different game than earlier in session where right like you have time to do bill development and you can like search for authors and like you're fighting for hearings and now it's really like fighting for money and final for final inclusion, like making sure that um, the things that we care about aren't uh, negotiated out during conference committee. Um, so we are past their deadline. We are right now, they have started to um, hear budget omnibus bills on the floor of both bodies. So um, we are going to be for the next couple of weeks hearing omnibus bills in both bodies. Um, they may mostly don't match um, between the House and the Senate. Um, so after we are done passing omnibus bills for the first time, we'll go into what's called conference committee. Um, so my understanding is that the House is planning to be done with their first passage of omnibus bills um, by Sunday the 30th at the latest and like more realistically, they're hoping for Friday the 28th. 
Um, the actual like real deadline uh, for the first passage is April 5th, um, which means that conference committees between the House and the Senate could start as soon as the first week of April. Um, you mean that, you mean May 5th? No, it's April right now. Oh, it is April. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. That's a we. I think we got oh. it. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 No, I. <laughs> no, that's that's cool. actually like I didn't know what month it was. So thank you, Kate. Like <laughs> that is fine. real. That was real. Uh, May fifth. It does feel um, like delay. <laughs> so. Um, so so oh, so ahead. to kind of to bring it back to to the focus of this evening and folks who are here to learn about specific policies and investments. Um, like, where do you see as key ways for Minnesotans to just show up and have an impact and advocate effectively? As you're saying, we're not in bill development. We're not trying to find authors. We're at a very specific moment. And where do you see the strongest influence for folks fo for folks being able to advocate and influence um, within the trajectory of the budget development? Definitely. Um, so key hearings are like hearings are mostly wrapped up there's a couple of like key ones left that are just sort of like uh not that big things aren't changing in those hearings now but they are mostly like past that point and are on to um ways and means in the house and finance in the senate which are um the sort of last stop before you can go to the floor uh so really the place that we are all like is our best bet all of us to influence what is in the final package um, to me is during conference committee. So that means likely that like a lot, some of the stuff that we really like and we really want isn't gonna be passed off of the house or Senate floor the first time that they vote on a bill, right? So like, uh, for example, there's stuff that I really care about that's in the house omnibus energy bill and not in the Senate energy omnibus bill. Um, and so- but Can you give an example of something that is Local climate Abby. action planning grants. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll learn more about that from Abby, but yeah. yes. Um, so local climate action planning grants made it into Patty Acomb's budget. It did not make it into Senator Nick Francis' budget. So uh, they're both going to pass their bills off of the floor without adding that in. We're not going to try to do like a floor amendment or something because um, we can get into more like of the strategy later, but it is a lot more uh, realistic and effective to get things added in conference committee. So essentially conference committee, just like as a little like primer is essentially like leadership from each committee in both bodies form like a mega committee. Um, they're not mega cause they're not big, but like uh, it's a unit committee between the different bodies um, where they hammer out those differences. So, right. Like we know that, uh, when we got targets uh, at the bit like a few weeks ago, um, they matched for the House, the Senate, and the Governor. Which and just to put in there, targets is basically like an agreed amount part, agreed amount of spending for each budget bill. Um, so and focus, that's yeah. Sorry, thank you. And so you're working within an like your this the pot of money that will be spent in each area is decided, and now the decision making is around how much goes to where within that overall budget target. Exactly. So conference committee is where uh, the chairs and whoever else that ends up on the conference committees will decide like how they make their math problem, which are our programs add up to uh, what that number is and matches. So there's a lot of negotiating that happens. Um, it's a smaller group of people that you are trying to influence to like add your thing. Um, and I think like those are the biggest moments really um, where we can shift things um, in the way that we want them. Cool. Um, that's super helpful. Um, and I think I am going to move us to the rest of the sections, unless you have anything else you specifically, anything you want people to know, a takeaway, something for people to think about and act on um, um, in the coming days. So I think as we are working really hard and fighting for all of the things that we care about, I think one thing I want everyone to carry with them and be thinking about is like how 
the stuff that we are doing at the Capitol is like going to actually impact like Minnesotans all across the state. And like that is meaningful and it like has an impact, but also like we have an opportunity to like change the way that people think about their government and like whether it's working for them and like maybe, right, if we can talk about what we're accomplishing in the right ways, like we can continue to build the power to like keep doing good stuff and like keep passing programs in the future that like are even uh, bigger than the ones that we're doing, building more power, like getting stronger majorities so that we can keep passing stuff that at the end of the day, like really impacts people's lives. Yeah, that's what I'll say. I I so appreciate that um, over our chance, like understanding of, for our democracy, one of the things needed for our democracy to thrive is that people feel and believe and see government working effectively for them. And we have a real, we are seeing that already, I think with a lot of these policies and we have a real chance, like literally day-to-day -day people's lives on the ground, how it works. So I'm excited about that possibility for this session as well. I'm gonna ask Janet, if you're listening to mute yourself, cause we're getting some background noise from you. Thank you, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, and uh, thank you, Aurora. Um, so moving on to our next sections, I'm really excited. We have an amazing group. Like this is, so I, I've worked on um, climate and clean energy in the state of Minnesota in the policy space for uh, a while now. Uh, 2007 is the first session and I served in office then. And I, at that time I couldn't like, in my wildest dreams would not have been able to imagine the number and quality and expertise and skill of advocates and community and civic leaders across Minnesota who are working on climate, but in really all these different ways. You know, there was like a handful of climate champions 15 years ago, and now we have tons of climate champions in the legislature supported and, uh, and uh, counseled by and uh, pushed by um, really amazing uh, people leading on different parts of addressing climate change. And we have I was, uh, an all-star <laughs> group of people to talk with us tonight about that. So I'm super excited to dig in on like getting down in specific things, actions we can invest in to make progress on reducing emissions and building up our climate resilience. So we're gonna move into that. Um, and I, I also want to say just for all the panelists, um, I am going to be writing up a summary of the this conversation tonight, including the actions that folks can take to advocate and sharing that out with our 100% list. Um, this builds on a series of blog posts that I have written about what a climate budget could look like and where we can make really strong investments um, for uh, the future of our state and addressing climate change. And if you wanna check out the 100% plug, please don't go read it now because we want you in the room with us listening, but just so you have it, I'm gonna be writing up this conversation and posting it as our next blog post there. So excited to have it kind of go further from, from this event as well. So jumping in on transportation and um, our two panelists are Sam Rockwell, the executive director of Move Minnesota and Sonita Vanderloo from MN350, the transportation organizer there. Um, and I think I'm going to start with Sam because Sam has kind of a broad overview of transportation and I want to go deeper on the electric school bus work that uh, you and others have been doing, Sonita. Um, and I mean, the big take home message on where this is a big challenge is transportation is the largest source of emissions in the state of Minnesota. Um, in a place where we need to make real progress fast and a place that takes significant public investment to do that, particularly building out our uh, transit infrastructure. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Sam to give us kind of the two or three minute overview, if you could, of, of why transportation is such an important place for the state to be making investments to really take on um, addressing climate change. Yes, I appreciate the uh... A time a specific time limit. Uh, thank you, Kate, and and everyone here. Um, uh, a lot of folks on this call are uh, folks who uh, we at Minnesota and, and and everybody else in this arena have been partnering with uh, on a lot of the specific bills uh, and a lot of the organizing and strategy. And um, and so uh, none of this would have happened without the folks on this call and many others uh, weighing in. So anyway, I just wanted to say say thank you. Um, 
and and acknowledge this is not really our our thing. There's a lot of uh, uh, I think importance of transportation, as as Kate noted, it's our highest greenhouse gas emitting sector here in the state of Minnesota and across the U.S. And as we think about what needs to happen in the transportation sector, uh, there's kind of two two things, right? I mean, that tr the emissions come from the vehicles that we drive. There are also emissions in in embodied carbon, the, st the stuff in the concrete and so on, and in the supply chains. But a lot of the emissions come from the process of moving vehicles around, uh, internal combustion vehicles. And so you can either get those vehicles to run cleanly, or you can stop using those vehicles as much to reduce emissions. And we need to ultimately do both. When we look at what we have to accomplish here, uh, we functionally can't electrify fast enough um, in order to meet the greenhouse gas reduction kind of timelines that we're on, right? Um, part of that is because we make actually very high quality cars. Um, and uh, uh, and so, you know, I mean, raise your hand if you've ever like driven in a car that's more than 20 years old, like everybody's gonna raise their hand. Um, probably many of you will, like have a car that's more than 20 years old. So that means that the cars that are being sold today the vast majority of which even at this point are our internal combustion vehicles are going to be on the road 20 years from now. And so we have to think about those timelines. And, and so we have to say, okay, well, we have to be thinking way ahead and we have to be reducing how much uh, we're using. We also need to reduce how much, um, uh, how many vehicles are on the road for all sorts of quality of life issues uh, and reasons to have communities that are places we wanna live. Um, and also because it reduces the overall strain on the, the grid, the electricity sector, um, the amount of lithium that we need, all of these things play into uh, uh, a need to reduce how much we drive. So I can talk about this uh, in more detail on some of the specifics um, after after I receive the mic back from Sunita for a little bit, but uh, that's kind of the over overarching view of why this is important. Before going okay. to Sunita, I want to dig in specifically on the transit stuff because it's a really key um, issue right now in, in the state. <laughs> like it's a yeah. highly debated, very active place where we're focused. And it's it's a place where we can't, we literally cannot do it without state investment. It's like, it's a collective good we're investing in. And so could you give people just like a quick quick version of what the debate is right now and yeah. um, what you're hoping to see specifically from the transit investment perspective. Yeah, so uh, uh, transit, when we're talking about transit investments, the, the vast majority of it refers to the transit that is occurring in the metro area. That's where the concentration is, uh, where the people are. Um, but there are transit investments across state needed. The biggest push right now is for long-term dedicated funding to support transit operations and a real transformation of the system. Um, we have a, a set of land use patterns in the Twin Cities Metro that have in the past supported people relying almost entirely on transit and like biking and walking to get around um, because we existed before the car and we had a like, huge wholly electric streetcar system. So we know it works. Um, and so we are pushing for, you know, we started the session pushing for a one cent sales tax, one cent meaning 1% uh, uh, sales tax to support long-term uh, dedicated uh, revenue for transit. We need to have it be long-term, the, but there's a lot of discussion about, well, why can't you use the surplus? And the reason you can't use the surplus is because as we make investments in improving different lines, then the operation costs go up as well, right? When you have a bus running, uh, more often, and you have like more infrastructure there, it costs more to maintain it. Yeah. And, and right one of the key things is we want buses to come often enough so people don't have to like memorize the schedule. Like in my neighborhood, the bus oh. comes every half hour, or once an hour on the half hour. It's not often enough to like really use it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's insane. I mean, so we we put together kind of a plan that, that looks at what would it cost? We cost it at what would it cost to, to support like five to 10 minute frequencies? and build out a system of you know, more than 20 lines that can really serve kind of the full metro. And that's what we're pushing for. And, uh, and so we can get you know, into the details. Right now we're, we have in the house bill, a 
percent sales tax, which is a really good sales tax and allows us to transform the system and maintain it long term. And it pays for all the like electrification work that needs to happen as well, um, safety initiatives and transit ambassadors and a variety of other things. So it's really about like transforming that system into something that is something that you use intuitively, uh, that you want to use. That's just you don't think about what kind of you're using every morning. That's just what that's the most obvious thing to do and so you do it yeah cool so right now there's a 0.75 percent so like 75 cents for sales tax or not sorry 0.75 of one cent not 75 percent that that yeah. would be really high if it was yeah, yeah, yeah um in the metro area to pay for dedicated ongoing sustained right. transit funding so that's Which like would... a big thing to push and advocate for it right now and it is not, I think Aurora was referring to this, um, it, it is no, no longer as of this morning, uh, uh, three quarters of a penny, 0.75 cents in the Senate. It is now, it was reduced this morning. And so <laughs> I will give my actions at the end of this, but we have to get it back up to that 0.75 uh, uh, of a cent because it's really important uh, and it is a really significant difference. Uh, we can go into that later if we want. Right. All right. Thank you, Sam. Um, I want to turn over to Sunita now. If you want to, um, I know there, talk a little bit about a specific area of transportation, reducing transportation emissions and pollution with electrifying school buses that you have been working on in MN350 in a, in a coalition. Um, and I want to hear why it's something you've taken on as an organization and the kind of both the emissions reductions, but I think significant health impacts, positive health impacts of electrifying school buses. So could you just help us understand why this matters um, within the broader transportation picture? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much uh, for that lovely start. And thank you, Sam, for getting us kicked off with the transportation. Um, so my name is Sunita Vanderloo. I am MN350's transportation organizer. Um, and our transport clean transportation team has been engaging with um, getting and implement or getting electric school buses to more and as many um, school districts within the state as possible. Um, and like what has been referred to already, um, transportation is one of the highest emitters for greenhouse gases, um, but also it has a huge impact on an individual's respiratory health. Um, and all humans, but especially when we think about our students that are going on to these school buses. Every day, some students ride these buses five days a week, nine months out of the year. And actually, students on school buses are exposed to five to 15 times the level of particulate pollution um, than nearby monitoring sites. And that is also um, up to four times the level of a nearby car. So these heavy and medium duty vehicles which electric school buses, or that's the goal, but school buses fall into heavy and, mood, heavy and medium duty uh, level vehicles, which emit a much higher amount of pollution, but there are few of the, fewer of them on the road. So then when you think about it, the more that we can transfer these vehicles to electric, that will decrease the amount of uh, pollution, diesel that's going into the air, which will then have positive effects on individuals' respiratory health. Um, and also really quick to kind of hone back in on the students. Um, there are studies actually shown um, that students when they're riding on diesel um, buses that can this can impact their learning ability. Um, this can impact students um, ability for test taking. There have been scores shown from students who they will test better if they are not riding diesel buses. Um, also attention, learning development, especially when you have the super young ones who ages, you know, five to 10 years old riding these buses every single day that we are sending them to their education and we are setting them up the best way possible. Um, and then also on top of that, there are respiratory impacts that come from, sorry, my cat's really, but um, respiratory impacts from that. There are students who this could increase their chances of asthma or uh, kind of inflame them. Um, I've met parents who they are nervous to even put their child on a school bus because their child already deals with the repercussions of asthma and are worried that riding that bus over time will trigger that and make that health condition even worse for them. 
Um, so what's really important is for these electric school buses that we are setting our students up for a healthier future in facing climate change, but also we're help making a healthier future for their own personal health because um, that's what our students deserve in the communities around them. Yeah, so it has really like intergenerational equity issues yeah. in terms of um, both the climate impacts and the immediate health and learning mm -hmm. benefits for kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a six-year-old and I think about her like breathing in that diesel fume and it is not, yeah, I do not, it's not an image or thing I like to think about as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, so can I go a little specific on um, what, what you're look what you're hoping to get at this point in the session in terms of the investment. And I'm I'm curious if uh the way equity intersects. I mean we talked about the intergenerational equity, but is there like prioritization thinking about like specific schools or districts that'll get priority if you could mention I'm not sure. I'm curious if there is. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um and also I would love to shout out the 100 percent campaign right now. Um you all have done fantastic work to kind of help get us to where we are with the electric school bus campaign. So woo. Um, but what we are looking for, so at the beginning of session, um, we as a team were kind of looking at what other states had done that had been more successful with getting more electric school buses, um, whether that's through different programs like through the EPA or if there have been state initiatives. And something that has been coming up over and over and over again is state funding. Uh, for example, Colorado had allocated 65 million um, and Michigan had, they have allocated, you know, even more than that. And so that funding has been a really crucial piece to be able to help get these school districts, these electric school buses, because one electric school bus can cost around, this is an average and it's not always considering the infrastructure costs, but around $400,000 for one electric school bus. And obviously as well, like with time and with more coming in, that price could go down, but that is a lot to ask of a school district. So having that funding come in from the state is super important. Um, and so something also that was included, we were pushing for um, this house file that made it through the Senate and through um, the house, sorry, that was redundant, um, which is an electric school bus deployment uh, program. And like you were saying with the priority schools, so through the EPA's program, they use the small area home income poverty um, parameters, which then that breaks down to S-A-I-P-E. Um, and for theirs, it is 20% or uh, more students living in poverty based off of the most recent uh, US census. But this bill with it, that is right now we're watching um, in the legislature has brought that down to 7.5%. So that helps make it even more inclusive um, because previously with the EPA's program, there were school districts such as Minneapolis who did not make that criteria mark. And so the positive thing about if this bill does make it all the way through, this will be able to help get um, as many students who could also be in um, areas where they're already facing um, high levels that are affecting their respiratory health and getting those buses um, to those communities. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sonita. I'm going to I'm going to uh, send it back to Sam for uh, one final quick question. But I was wondering if there is a, a quick action you have for folks to take. And if you have a link to it in the chat, that would be awesome. Yes, Something of folks course. Can do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'll drop it in the chat now. Um, this is a link for people to right now they're negotiating between 14 million in the House and 7 million in the Senate. And we want to get as much funding as possible for our students this year. So um, the link I just dropped in the chat. And then also, if you have any questions, my email is there too. Awesome. Thank you, Sonita. Um, that's so click on that link and leave the tab open so you can pay attention to the next things that you can take that you can do. Um, I'm going to kick it back to Sam now, and you you kind of reference this a little bit um, uh, in terms of an action you could take and what you're trying to make happen. So I would like you to 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 quickly describe that, but I I wanted to just probe a little bit on an equity issue around a sales tax as being a regressive tax and investing in transit and and how you have with the coalition you've worked with on this um, and kind of trying to make sense of that uh, that balancing of different things yeah uh that's certainly an issue that comes up and uh i think it, this is a little bit of like a pat answer but one that is very true which is uh it is by far by far the most regressive system that we have is forcing people to own it a car to get around yeah. 
I mean, it is a $10,000 a year expense for families. When you look at like the federal government's expenditure surveys, it's just bananas. And, uh, and so if we can create a system that relieves that regressivity, um, it, you know, that is a progressive system. So is a sales tax the most progressive form of taxation? It's not, is that what we've seen as a model in other places that has worked? It is, and also we have some levels of progressivity in that tax with, um, with exemptions on food, clothing, um, but, uh, uh, and so I think it's not it's not as much as what, yeah. what people are painting. I just want to go go directly to 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 have because that's I think that's a question that people have. So yeah. I appreciate you uh, bringing that into the conversation. And then what action do you have uh, that people can take to help get sustained yeah. funding for transit? Well, or Aurora, anything else? <laughs> or anything else? As Aurora mentioned, uh, you know, this is really going to come down to uh, the uh, the conference committees. And negotiations, and so I'll drop an action in the chat, which is just telling folks uh, that you know having this full uh, three quarters of a cent funding for transit uh, is really, really, really important. And if you, if you're if your legislator, please do it. And if you can pass it on, please do. Awesome, thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sonita. We we just covered transportation. We have a minute. We're a minute ahead of my set schedule, so I feel like we have four more. Fantastic panelists, and so I want to thank our first two and um, jump next to uh, building climate resilience. And really excited um, to have two uh, women here to talk about ways that we can invest in building the uh, of adapting to climate change and building our resilience to the climate changes already underway. Um, and you know, we definitely want to keep reducing emissions ramping up how fast we reduce emissions. And something we've really been increasing focus on here at the 100% campaign is also making sure we're investing to um, build the resilience uh, in the um, in the face of a climate that is already changing and that we're already feeling the impacts of. So we've got two awesome panelists here to talk about that. But I'm gonna start with Abby Finnis. Uh, sorry, Stephanie, I wrote your name twice, but we're starting with Abby. And Abby um, is with Local Climate Solutions and has done a lot of work across the state of Minnesota on uh, helping communities build climate action plans and um, uh, just has a real strong overall sense of what local governments need um, and what they can do to build resilience in the face of climate change. And, and we think um, that making sure local governments and communities have the tools they need to take on and to prepare in the face of climate change is a super important part of resilience building. So I was gonna talk about a, a range of bills. There's multiple <laughs> bills, there's not one here of how the state um, uh, can invest in helping build resilience at the, the local community level. So I'm gonna turn it over to Abby with the question of, you know, can you give us sort of a, an overview of the, the key handful of areas that you see as important for investing to build the capability um, of local governments and communities to build climate resilience. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for inviting me to share with folks. Um, I'm Abby Finnis, Local Climate Solutions. I've been uh, working on local climate action for um, more than 13 years. Once I get to 2010, I can't do math after that. So. <laughs> um, uh, so it's really exciting to see, you know, all of the funding and support that looks like it's going to make its way through to help local governments um, with the climate planning and resilience. And, um, you know, local governments have really been kind of doing the heavy lifting, I think, especially in the United States on driving climate action and pushing for state and federal policy on climate action. Um, and so they're really well poised to uh continue to work on this. So for those who already have climate action plans to really get going and accelerating their implementation efforts. Um, and for those who don't have climate action plans um, to get going on plans and get going on implementation. Um, Cause it's, it's a really great time to not just get the state funding but also the federal opportunities that are available as well. And I think that one of the things that we see is there's a lot of communities that are smaller um, that want to do climate action. They want to do climate action planning, but they don't always have the resources um, to be able to do that. Um, so some of the bills that I'll talk about will give them some of those resources, whether it's 
uh, straight up just funding uh, to, to do their own plans and implementation. Um, there's also some technical assistance available. There's also some, some resources that go toward uh, data and education. Um, and I'll just kind of preface this with, you know, the importance of local action, you know, one city doing uh, um, actions on, on reducing emissions isn't going to have a major effect on our, our global emissions, right? But all of these cities doing them will start to add up. And so we will start to see uh, that dent in emissions. And, you know, the other things are that cities have control over a lot of things that happen within their communities. They have control over what the land use is and, you know, what the transportation patterns can be within communities. Um, they have some control over what we can do with um, the buildings and the efficiency there. Um, and they're most impacted, right? When the storms come through, uh, we've got sandbagging happening along the St. Croix and the Mississippi and the Red River, right? Those are all locally felt. Um, so the impacts are local. And so it's that much more important to get the funding where it needs to go. So with that, I will highlight a, a few bills that I think are most key for advancing uh, climate action among uh, local governments. And when I say that, I mean uh, cities, counties, townships, um, other political subdivisions, uh, like school districts uh, are getting funding, and then also tribal governments um, are getting funding from the state and federal opportunities as well. Um, so the first one up, uh, Aurora mentioned the local climate action planning grants. Um, and so this is 4 million uh, available for grants that include climate action planning and implementation. Um, and those plans and implementation can address both greenhouse gas emissions reduction and uh, adaptation efforts. Um, and so the funds will primarily be used for issuing grants, but there will also be some that are reserved for uh, technical assistance. So sometimes communities don't necessarily wanna hire a consultant, but they have some, some technical questions that they may, may need answered. Um, so having those resources available. Um, and then another key piece of climate action plans is having that greenhouse gas data and inventory available so that you can uh, set your baseline, you can track and measure your progress. Um, and so Aurora mentioned that that is in the House uh, omnibus, but not the Senate. And so I think that's one key area is to make sure that, that it, it sees its way all the way through. Um, the other program is the Weather Ready Program through the University of Minnesota Extension Services. Um, so this is providing basically a million year over year. So that's right, Kate, um, yeah. to yeah. We have Heidi Roop, Dr. Heidi Roop, who's listening in. She can, you know, she is, virtually, I know. Like, I better get who, this right. Uh, who runs this, uh, who's, who runs University of Minnesota Climate Extension currently, and, and we're wanting to get more resources because they're a key, mm -hmm. um, a key uh, way to help support communities do this work. Yeah, and so this is really looking at identifying and developing uh, educational programs that help uh, provide resources to the agriculture sector, to land resource managers, to those local governments on, you know, what are the latest prediction projections for uh, climate hazards in your community and how do you start to plan for that? And so um, getting that information is really key to being able to plan, you know, what size culvert do we need? Uh, what is the impact of green infrastructure on our stormwater management? Um, those kinds of things uh, and, and just better understanding that. And so, um, that one uh, is definitely in the house uh, omnibus. Uh, Kate, is that? It's um, not yet in the Senate. Okay. So okay. Um, there's, they're working on it. So that's another place is advocating yeah. in the Senate for investing in the weather ready program at the U. Yeah, and I think the next one will kind of swing the, the pendulum the other way with the Resilient Communities Grant. Um, and this one is really focusing more on infrastructure and adapting infrastructure to uh, climate changes. Um, and so this one was actually, the governor requested 173 million um, for this one. The Senate matches that essentially, and then the House comes in at 40 million. So it kind of flip the other way. And so I think that there's probably a lot of room here to, to figure out um, funding between these three bills in particular that are kind of hitting on uh, similar pieces for, for local entities. And I have to say, as someone who's like worked on adaptation and resilience, when I saw the governor's budget recommendation come out with $173 million of resilient communities money, I was like, this is more than I like thought of asking for it, which is which is really exciting that we have this opportunity to invest, and it's not ongoing, right? It's it's budget surplus that would go into it, um, 
And then as I started asking around more, it's like, the reason it's so much is because they've seen that much demand for this yeah. kind of state investments to help yeah. communities plan for, and then really importantly, implement these stormwater projects or um, green infrastructure projects or like ways to managing heat in their communities. So um, local governments don't, don't, they don't necessarily, they, they absolutely do not have all the financial resources needed to build the community resilience and to do those projects. So um, it is a really big number and it's probably still not nearly what we will need over mm -hmm. the course of the next years and decades to do the infrastructure updates we need. So Absolutely. yeah, it's a, but it is, an, I think it's a very exciting potential to have it be as big as it is. Yeah, and you're right, it, it is based, they have, uh, the PCA puts out these planning grants um, and they overwhelmingly get hit with more requests than they have funding for. So it's good yeah. to see that yeah. reflected here. Um, I'll just end with, um, there's a lot of federal opportunities. And so I think that one of the, the other big bills is this state competitiveness fund, uh, which basically creates a fund for any entity that is eligible to apply uh, for federal dollars. Uh, the state will help to provide the matching funds if they can't come up with it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Abby. And if you yeah. have, I don't know if we have an action alert um, for the 100% campaign, but maybe we will have one yeah. after this. I'll see if we'll put it in uh, the Get on the senators, yeah. This is, uh, <laughs> um, but again, uh, a great overview of why local, investing in local action and planning is super important. Um, and I want to shift to another really key part of resilience um, with uh, Stephanie, is it Pinkala? I'm not yeah. sure if I'm, thank you. You got it. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, from, who is government relations director for in base of Minnesota for the Nature Conservancy. And uh, not surprisingly, climate change impacts our ecosystems and how our trees and our grasslands and our agricultural lands, whether it's heat or uh, increased rain or snow, um, and we need to make sure those lands are prepared for climate impacts and that we are investing in ways that those lands are um, helping us be, as people be resilient in the face of climate change. And there's some really exciting ways that the state can make those investments that are in play this year. Um, and so wanted to have Stephanie describe that a little bit. So could you give us first starting with like a, a like kind of a high level of like why investing in lands matters for climate resilience? And you what, bet. Yeah. And yeah. thanks for having me and join you all this evening. So at the Nature Conservancy, we like to use the term natural climate solutions um, to talk about this body of work that Kate was just describing. And while resilience is actually a huge piece of this, we can achieve both mitigation and adaptation through natural climate solutions. Not for everything, right? Like the climate crisis is huge. Nature cannot solve all of our problems. Um, but science from the Conservancy shows that at least as it relates to Minnesota, um, as much as 20 to 25% of the emissions reductions that we need in the state can come from nature-based practices or again, natural climate solutions. And on top of that, we're getting resilience benefits or adaptation benefits if you're into the lingo of natural climate solutions um, to help us prepare for what's what's already here, you know, more flooding and more droughts and what um, will only intensify as time goes on. And so we, as Kate mentioned, kind of think about these natural climate solutions and the benefits in some different categories based on the um, carbon sequestration potential or the resilience benefits that we can get from them, but it, it breaks down more simply into forests, forestry, tree planting, um, lands, sequestration, so think grasslands, wetlands, agricultural lands, and then avoided conversion, um, so and the resilience piece kind of comes along with that, but like lands that are already natural, that if we were to develop them or turn them into agricultural lands um, or open them up in some way that we would actually be releasing more carbon into the atmosphere. Um, so peatlands is one of the big areas where this comes to mind because peatlands in particular can store quite a bit of carbon um, and have been for many, many years. Um, and so the loss of peatlands in Minnesota is a huge um, climate risk. So as it relates to all these different opportunities and where they're sitting um, when it comes to the state's budget setting process. Um, I'll kind of talk about it in those buckets. So when it comes to forestry, we know science shows us that like this is our number one opportunity in Minnesota, both for 
carbon sequestration and for adaptation goals. Um, because in addition to trees storing a lot of carbon, they also are huge water quality sponges. Um, trees give us a lot of clean water. And that's why if you go to Northern Minnesota where we have quite a few trees, um, we happen to have really good water quality in a lot of places. Um, in addition to this, like the science that we have shows that we have a lot of lands in Minnesota that could support more trees than they have. So forests that could you know, have more trees in them or natural lands that maybe historically were forested and haven't been forested for a long time for various reasons. And we could be planting more trees there to get those carbon and water benefits. Um, so for us, like this is where we should be spending the most money when it comes to natural climate solutions is in getting more trees on the ground anywhere we can in the state. Um, so there are a few different programs to help do that. One is having the state's uh, forest lands just continue to plant trees and uh, proactively plant more trees where they're able to. Um, another is making sure that we are able to produce enough tree seedlings to plant across the state. There's actually a tree seedling shortage. Um, right now, the state of Minnesota, the Nature Conservancy, other organizations that plant trees in Minnesota can't get enough seedlings in our own state. We have to import them from other states, from Canada, which is fine if you're those other states in Canada, um, but it's also money out the door that could be supporting lots of other great economic activity in Minnesota um, and save um, carbon emissions <laughs> from people shipping tree seedlings back and forth. Yeah, this was um, kind of mind blowing to me that we literally yeah. like need to ramp up seed collection and ramp up the ability of our state nursery to like grow more tree seedlings. Yeah, it's like, like a, it's like a, a part of crisis I, we have. You know, we think about um, the mobilization needed for climate change. It's like weatherization and electrification. It's like we also just need more trees, and so we there's just need more trees. Yeah, and people surprisingly planting trees very popular. Republicans yeah. like Democrats <laughs> like it. Thing is, we don't have enough trees to be able to plant. So in the budget proposals that are on the table in both the House and Senate, um, there is some money to bolster the state's forest nursery. Um, that's actually, it's not in the budget bills that we've kind of been talking about. It's in the capital investment or bonding bill, which hopefully we'll move forward this session. Um, but other, other tree related activities is managing trees for a carbon outcome. So a lot of our state owned lands in particular trees are managed for timber outcome, which has its benefits certainly in some cases, <laughs> um, but we could be managing for carbon as the primary outcome and, and keeping types of trees on the landscape um, that are going to store carbon for longer or can store more carbon than other tree species. So that's funded um, in the budget bills. Um, money for communities to be able to plant trees and replace trees that have been lost to emerald ash borer and other pests. Um, those programs are both funded robustly in the House and Senate's budget proposals. Um, I'm trying to think of those, those are kind of the big ones, but like trees are looking really good when it comes to the state budget. Um, and forestry as a whole, we have a lot of good things on the table. On um, the next, or and I see a question in the chat, what are, what trees are best for carbon storage? I unfortunately do not know the answer. Um, that's a good good thing to research, but as the government I mean, relations I person, they just give me a few talking points. So as, <laughs> as a PhD, I do have a PhD in conservation too. And I wouldn't, I, I don't actually know the specific answer to this, but it's, I think one of the things that's really important is we have a diverse, um tree set of trees like I my neighbor's ash tree was literally just taken down today it's very sad it's like a huge beautiful tree on our block um and so it's making sure we get a mix of trees to to prevent the huge loss of a single species um and that we're also planting trees that will be able to thrive as the climate changes and as the environment they're living in changes definitely and that is a um requirement that's built into some of these programs already is to make sure that not only are we planting a lot of trees, but we're planting a diverse you know, set of species in any given area and that we're planting trees that are gonna be climate adapted. So we already know, like we have the science that shows which trees are gonna do well in different parts of the state, um, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now. So that's definitely baked into all of this too. But so that if I can leave anything with you, it's that trees are in a really good place. So we just need to make sure that they pass those budget bills with all the good tree money in there. And there's an, um, I was pleased to see there's an omnibus tree bill that Representative Lee Finke put in, yeah. which has like multiple different ways to invest in tree. I, I just love, personally love the idea of an omnibus tree bill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we are working with Representative Finke on that. So if you're a big fan of trees, um, 
I will, I guess this is premature, I'll put it in the chat now. I'm dropping some links um, to the Nature Conservancy's legislative page and then to sign up for action alerts that we put out related to natural climate solutions. So when the time comes and that bill is um, moving in the capital invest investment space, we would love to keep you in the loop about it. Um, but other than forestry, so we have kind of the lands and the water resilience um, piece of it. The, um, use of lands as a resilience tool. So to help mitigate flooding, to help um, wild, various wildlife species continue to survive despite challenges and pressures um, imposed by climate change to help people also be able to survive. There are a lot of programs that affect our lands um, that can help achieve those goals. A lot of them happen to be easement programs. So permanent protection of conservation lands, but in often cases, private lands. Um, so working with agricultural landowners um, or other large landowners who typically tend to be outside of the seven county metro area, this is a really important climate strategy and also gets to that avoided conversion of land. So like for an example, um, Minnesota has been home to a lot of people who have grass fed cattle operations, right? They're like raising a handful or probably more than a handful, maybe dozens um, of cows on a grassland landscape, like they are hugely important as a climate solution um, because having large acreages of grassland is again, great for water, keeps carbon in the ground, um, also supports a lot of prairie habitats in many cases. Like we need to keep those types of landowners intact versus seeing those lands converted to row crop agriculture or converted to some form of development. Um, so there are easement programs that target landowners like that. Um, other similar angles through what's called reinvest in Minnesota, which is a series of easement programs that apply all over the state. Um, in addition to that, with or in addition to that particular program, another big one that shows up heavily in the budget bills is one called water storage. Um, so we have a lot of flooding in Minnesota, we've seen it, and now we have drought. Um, and we'll ping back and forth between those two lots of times. Something that can help us mitigate flooding, especially upstream of communities that suffer from flooding and also potentially um, help us to store some water ahead of, or in advance of drought is water storage easements. So it's artificial changes on people's property to be able to store water. In some cases it could be like, hey, somebody has a farm field and it floods all the time and we just keep paying them crop insurance. <laughs> they just keep collecting their crop insurance and losing their crop. What if we just recognize that that property is always going to flood and let's like set it aside as an area that we're going to collect flood water and hopefully retain some of it as well to reduce the downstream impacts to reduce you know water pollution um, but also help us potentially be more resilient by storing some of that water and being able to use it later so a lot of programs that get at that goal or those goals of avoided land conversion and flood mitigation um, are included in both the budget bills, but not quite at the investment levels that we would like to see. Um, and that's just because a lot of competing priorities, but they're definitely included um, and have like a good chunk of change and there's landowners ready to go to enroll in these programs. So it's in a relatively good place, although we would love to see more. And then finally, as it relates to um, land, land protection and more avoided conversion, a big bucket that has always struggled to um, maintain funding from the legislature is land acquisition or land protection. And if any of you here enjoy um, outdoor recreation on state lands, you might be familiar with um, some of the designations that are out there like wildlife management areas or scientific and natural areas, aquatic management areas. These are all names, various names or titles for different forms of land protection in the state where land is permanently protected. So unlike easement programs where you can have permanent protection, but it's a private landowner who's you know, doing the state a favor. Um, these public land designations not only permanently protect land, but are also publicly or open to the public for various you know, outdoor recreation opportunities, fishing, foraging, hunting, bird watching, you name it. Um, and in addition to providing those great benefits for us directly, they also provide, again, those water benefits, carbon sequestration benefits, and most importantly, the adaptation potential for a lot of plant and wildlife species. I will say of all of the great natural climate solutions that are on the table moving forward in the budget bills, these are not in great shape. Um, and again, like this has historically been the case, um, regardless of party, it's hard to fund 
uh, public land acquisition. I think you know there's this narrative out there that people are good. We've got our state park system. Like they're not people aren't looking for more opportunities to get outside. Why would we spend money on land protection? It doesn't have any benefits, but it has a ton of benefits. Um, and we know that these lands are also in really high demand. So if there's anything that I can leave with you that's like, we need to take action on this, it is advocating for public lands protection um, because it's it's the only thing that's like zeroed out in a lot of the budget bills. Cool. Um, well, not cool, that's yeah. not cool, but I, <laughs> that was a super useful overview. I I learned like just have, I, I like to know like frameworks to help make sense of like the big piece of, yeah. The, like the big, like the the pieces of the bigger whole of climate work, and that's that really helped me understand the the nature based climate solutions and and like what we can do on our our lands and in our ecosystems. So, um, that was super helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna have to move us on, yeah, um, but you you did put uh, action alert in the chat, um, and I want to tap into something you said at the last uh, in one of your last comments um, is that you know, the trees and the um, easements are in pretty good shape in terms of being in the bills, but not at the levels we would like, or you would like to, you know, the Nature Conservancy would like to see. And I think that's a reminder to all of us that um, as much of a budget surplus as we have this year, um, and as many great investments as we can make with it, um, part of the reason we have this surplus is we've been under-investing um, in key public goods, uh, over years, and um, we need to make sure we have we we still we still have more we need to do as a state um, together to build the kind of Minnesota uh, with an equitable clean energy and climate resilient future. And so this last part of the conversation is focused exactly on um, uh, yeah. If you want to put some stuff about soil health in the chat, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I think we could literally have a conversation about every single panelist piece here. So um, we're moving fairly quickly, but uh, I want to now move with us to talk about financing and um, funding. Uh, and Ashley, Eric wants to share some slides. And I think you are the um, owner of the the um, the Zoom. And so you're a co-host, Eric, now you should be able to share. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about how we make sure to continue investing and in ramping up investing in um, helping Minnesotans take on climate change and build um, uh, climate resilient or a climate safe future. Um, and so Eric Harris Bernstein is here from We Make Minnesota. He's the uh, policy director there, I think is your official title. And he's going to talk, he talks about revenue all the time, taxes. Um, but I want to, uh, give him a chance to talk about why it's important that we have public money to make these really key climate investments and kind of the picture of where it is right now. So he even prepared a PowerPoint. Thank you. I don't know. I, hopefully it's, I'm not sure how long it is. How long is it, Eric? I, I just have some things to reference. Perfect. It's not of any Perfect. particular length. Awesome. Cool. So you are the, um, yeah. Uh, so if you want to jump in and give us kind of a four or five minute overview of why revenue matters and where we are um, in the session. I think that would be super helpful for folks. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kate and 100% team for having me. Um, as Kate said, I talk about taxes and revenue all the time. And uh, I asked Aurora earlier today what I should talk about. And she said, every time I see you, all you do is run your mouth about taxes and revenue. So we're just assuming you're going to do something like that. And so uh, so I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, uh, about the, the budget this year and the surplus and, you know, what what from my perspective it means. Um, and I'm going to share just a couple of perspectives on, you know, what does it mean uh, for the state to be adequately funded uh, and to be adequately funding, you know, our priorities, whether they are in this case, you know, maybe environment and natural resources or in other cases, healthcare, education and so on. Um, so just quickly, um, you know, as you've all heard, we have a, a you know, a pretty substantial surplus. Um, you know, you'd be lying if you said it wasn't, you know, somewhat uh, large. Um, but this slide, um, which is the best one I can find, it's not my favorite in the world, but it kind of shows um, how much of this 
surplus is um, one-time money uh, versus uh, money that we can expect to accrue into the future. Um, and so this slide in particular is comparing two different forecasts. So it's not ideal, but basically if we just look at this blue bar here on the right, um, we see that we have a $17.5 billion uh, surplus in total. And um, the state estimates or the, the state, you know, the, the reality is that 12.5 billion of it is one time. So that's money saved up. Uh, that's money saved up from uh, the last two years, uh, from a couple years before that. Uh, a lot of it has to do with federal money, um, both that came into the state, but also federal money, uh, federal support for state programs that reduced state costs over the last couple of years. So it sort of not only put some money in our coffers, but also reduced our expenditures. And now that those federal programs have ended or will shortly be ending, um, you know, we can probably expect that the picture will change. And then the remaining five billion um, is uh, the structural surplus. So that means that it's not money we have yet, but it's money that we expect that we will have over the next two years if revenues come in as we expect and if we don't raise our spending at all. Um, so I kind of have a, a qualm with calling this a, a surplus um, at all, because the reality is that there's no world where um, a, pu a public budget of any sort, whether it's a state or a federal budget, um, stays flat over time. Um, the reality is that most of what the state buys uh, when, when the state goes out and purchases public goods and services you know, uh, is labor. And the price of labor, uh, as we all know, rises every year, as do the price of you know, goods, things that the state buys like asphalt or steel beams or uh, lumber or whatever to build things, uh, vehicles, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, also public budgets rise because we want to improve um, you know, the quality of the services that we're providing. We want to expand affordable childcare. We want to make college cheaper. We want a cleaner environment. And so for all these reasons, um, getting to my next slide, the best way to judge the sufficiency of a state budget um, is as a share of the economy. And so what this slide, and I'm, I'm going to spend a, a, a little bit of time here just because I think that if you understand this, it gives you a really good frame of reference um, to kind of understand uh, or evaluate the state budget moving forward. Um, so this blue line is all of the money, state and local, um, that Minnesota raises to fund all of our public goods and services. Um, and so we have the 1990s over here on the left side, and then we get all the way up to 2024. Some of this is projected. Uh, the last two years are projected. Um, all the way to 2024 over here on the right side. And this dotted line that we have um, going across kind of the middle top here um, is our average spending as a share of the state economy during the 1990s. Um, so this is how much we would be spending uh, if we spent relative to the economy today as we did back then. And you can see the blue line is our actual spending and it's substantially lower. And there's a little graphic that I put in here. Actually, it happened to be Ashley that did this for me uh, for a separate project. Um, uh, that the difference between our current spending and our spending throughout the 1990s as a share of the economy would be $13 billion. We'd have $13 billion more this biennium if we were spending at 1990s levels. Um, so, you know, our structural surplus is five billion when we account for inflation. It's about six and a half billion, um, uh, you know, in in sort of cash terms. Um, and so basically, we would have double the structural surplus if our if we were raising revenues at the same rate that we were in the 1990s. And I think this is just an important perspective to keep in mind. Because what Republicans and or, you know other people who generally oppose increased government spending are fond of doing is saying, look at the budget. It's grown every year, year after year. And I pulled an example of this, which I'll show you quickly. Um, here's the environmental uh, resource budget uh, from 1991 to 2022. 
I picked environment. I, this is me playing to the home to you know to the home team here. Um, but you can do this with a lot of different areas of public spending. Uh, you know, higher education or education or uh, K twelve education or whatever. Um, so we have dollars here on the left. And then we have the years going across on the bottom. And you see that, you know, uh, 30 years ago, we were spending $150 uh, million on environmental resources. Uh, I think it's environment and natural resources, apologies. Um, these are in thousands, so it's not dollars, but thousands of dollars. So $150 million in the 19, you know, early, mid 90s. And, you know, now we're spending more than that. We're spending in recent years, almost double that. We're spending almost 300 million. A million dollars on that. And some people would say, well, we've doubled our spending in 30 years. That's a lot. But of course, we know that dollar today does not, a uh, dollar 30 years ago does not buy the same thing that a dollar today buys. And so we can look at this adjusted for inflation. And when we look at it adjusted for inflation, what we find is that actually we've gone from something around 325 and at one point way more, even almost $500 million. And we've gone all the way down to $250 million in more recent years. That's another way to look at this. I'm going to do one more and then I'll turn it over to questions. So um, we, we, so we have just like five or six more minutes for this section. Okay. So if you can do a quick with the one you want to show, and then I want to just ask you like where yep. do you see the state of play in session right now. Okay. So the last thing I want to do is just show you this yellow line shows the same thing as a share of the economy. And we can see that the, the trend is even more clearly downwards. And we see this across a lot of different areas. Okay. Um, <laughs> if I do that, I think it is really stark to see as a percentage of our economy, how our, in that state and local government combined has right. declined pretty right. significantly. Um, I can, I'm going to stop sharing because I don't think I have. So the question was, I'm sorry. He could literally go on forever. Yes, he could. <laughs> that was public in the chat from Ashley. Um, yeah, so could you talk, just give us a, I know this is uh, hard to do, but we're focused on this moment in session yeah. and where you see the, the revenue conversation, like, will there be tax cuts or do you see revenue increase? And I know we talked specifically um, about the transit uh, three quarters of a penny tax. You, you don't need to talk about that one. Um, but where do you see for general fund? Yeah. So overall for the general fund, um, you know, every year there is obviously a big conservative tax cut uh, ambition. Um, and this year it was a social security tax exemption um, that was potentially going to the full thing would cost $1.2 billion, um, which would be, you know, 20% of our structural surplus, an enormous amount of money and growing into the future. Um I think that when we got tax targets, so, you know, the target for the tax uh, tax budget is basically an, it's a it shows as a positive number because to the state, a tax cut, you know, is is an expenditure. Mm -hmm. um, when we got the tax target, I think most of us in the fiscal world were pretty happy uh, about it. It was um, three billion dollars in the first biennium. Um, but only only 1.3 billion dollars in the next biennium which implies that they are going to do uh you know a sizable one time rebate of some sort sort of something like you know walls checks as they've discussed um and then they will do some amount of permanent tax cutting um like i said the big kind of bad scary proposal that we were fighting against was or is um, exempting social security benefits from income. And that's a whole other presentation I, I would love to do for you another time. Um, uh, but there are other ideas of how to spend money through the tax bill that I would imagine most of us would probably be um, more interested in or favorable to. Um, uh, and that would be um, uh, uh, two big things. One is the child tax credit, which would be money for lower income families with young children. Uh, and the other would be the renter's credit, which is essentially, um, well, they might do it a couple of different ways, but essentially it's giving renters a property tax refund the way that homeowners can get a property tax refund if they, if their income is below uh, a certain amount. Um, so those are going to be three of the big components that make up that ongoing 
you know, um, tax tax target. Um, but there are other things that are funded through the tax bill that will also be in there. Um, so all to say, uh, from my perspective, we want tax dollars to go to funding public goods and services, not to lowering taxes in general. Um, however, knowing that we did have a large surplus and knowing the politics that were around it, I think we feel pretty good that some mix of good things and one thing we don't like is going to be in that, um, you know, that ongoing tax target, um, you know, that that it, we feel okay about that. The the exact breakdown between those three things is, is really anyone's guess. Mm -hmm. um, but based on the proposals that have been out there, you know, I think those three things will probably share a little bit more than a billion out of that 1.3 billion. And then there will be yeah. some various small <laughs> things in there. Yeah. Cool. Well, that was super helpful to to help us. You know, it doesn't always feel directly climate focused, but it's so important um, uh, in terms of our ability to fund our collective future. Um, and and so I think it's helpful for anyone in any issue area to have an understanding of the revenue system because if you're coming asking for money, understanding how it is raised is really really important. So appreciate you. Um, bringing that here and wanted to, if you have an action folks can take, I don't know if you do, you can put it in the chat and we will send it out. If you don't, that is also fine. Um, so I'm gonna jump now to Sarah Wolf from uh, Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Um, and she is gonna talk to us about a, a specific way we could um, spend some state money, invest some state money this year with the Minnesota Clean Innovation Finance Authority. She will tell you what that is and why it matters. And it's a way to help Minnesota sort of multiply investments in, um, in uh, building a better climate future. So I'm gonna turn it over to her to give us some of the details and we are running a little behind, but I don't need much time to wrap up. So if you could give us like two or three minutes of a, a, a why the Climate Innovation, Innov Innovation Finance Authority matters and why you think we should be investing in it this year, that would be, super helpful for this group. Thanks so much. It's a, a pleasure to join you. I'm sorry I had wasn't able to listen to everyone's presentations and I will be looking forward to a recording to go back to them. Um, my name is Sarah Wolf. I'm with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. I also work with CURE. Um, and I'm thrilled to be talking to you about the Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority, MNCFA, we lovingly call it. Um, because it's at a really important juncture in the process here. But I'll explain what it is by referring to it, um, the green bank concept that you might have heard about. Um, about two dozen states have them across the country. And if you've been following the Inflation Reduction Act, it's, there's a component called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is going to be spending $27 billion in, in the coming years, um, particularly through states that have green banks. Minnesota doesn't have one. And even if there weren't this federal opportunity, we would want one. Because what it does is it helps us take the little bit of money that we have and make it go further by attracting private finance so that we have more money and it directs that money to the places we want it to go. And where we want it to go is clean energy projects, technologies that are proven for communities that have particularly been underserved historically. So that could be a farm, that could be a rural town, that could be a neighborhood, that could be a place where people um, maybe have just not had access to the technical expertise. It could be um, lower income communities. It's the places where private finance right now hasn't said we're naturally going there for whatever reason. Maybe the projects are too small. Maybe they're just not, they don't have experience with that community. Maybe they need someone to do a lot more coordination about a set of projects. Network geothermal is kind of new, kind of difficult for private finance to understand. But if someone is guiding through that process, there's a lot of opportunity. So these projects that need to have a little bit of um, uh, a comfort level provided to them to attract that private finance. And what we found nationally is that the, the return is uh, three to four to five to six fold sometimes. So you invest a little bit of money and you're able to do many more projects. And if we just think about that, 
um, where we are with the state, and Eric was speaking to this, you've been probably talking about it all night. Everyone had really great hopes, not only with the trifecta, but the surplus. And now we're in this stage of, of, of accepting where our budget targets are um, and dealing with that and knowing that it's not giving us everything we wanted. And we need to place ourselves in the climate crisis that we're in and understand that if we are not gonna make the kind of investments that we need to make to fund this transition right now, when we have a $17 billion surplus, how are we gonna fund this transition? So grants alone, I would offer. Um, I love grants. Grants have a, a marvelous role, but we are probably not going to get the transition we need at the scale we need at the pace we need with grants. And if we become a revolving loan institution just with state funds, we can do more for sure. But are we going to be able to ramp it up to the degree we need to? What we need to do is create an ecosystem of finance that makes sure that when we're building projects, we're building them to the right standard starting this year, not waiting until 20 year emission, but we need to drive the market that way. And we do it with Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority. I guess for our state of play, we were asking for $45 million for this institution. It's creating a publicly accountable board. And what we wanted to do is work, not just for some places in some pockets of community, we wanted to start working statewide. So there's a lot of work to do, and we want it to be successful. We've just passed this 100% clean electricity bill. What we need is to make it real for people in ways that benefit statewide. So the Senate gave it $5 million, and that's just plainly not enough. And the House has it at $20 million, and that is, um, it's okay. But what I'm going to ask you to do is go to the action alert that we have here or write a letter or an email or make a phone call because what we want to do is get to this 45 million dollar level and i'm not going to ask for it to come from other programs although there there's a the the math of the green bank is you take a little bit um and that gives you more projects so if we were smart about our budget in totality we would be using this much more effectively throughout uh, throughout our agencies um, and for things like affordable housing and childcare and real community needs that need to be supported. But what we're looking for is getting to that $45 million number and that can come from many different places. And I don't think we need to be specific about that. What we need to express to leadership is that in this moment of climate crisis, when this decade matters the most, we are really on, uh, it's really insufficient what our uh, what our budget is is putting towards climate and energy. All of it is good, but if you remember, right before the pandemic, the House Climate Caucus was putting together a one billion dollar package for climate action, and we have a quarter of that right now in the climate and energy target. So the thing we want them to do is the thing that's going to multiply projects more, and that's this. And Kate, I will stop talking now. <laughs> Happy to awesome. ask questions. I put an action alert in there and please contact leadership and say, please support the Green Bank. We need more money and that we need more money all over the place. But if you're only going to find $45 million, this is where we need it to go. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. I and I we I, I think you're maybe in your car. I can't tell you had a kid event tonight. So that's why you had to. I appreciate you coming in and making it work because I think this is a place where people might not have heard of it yet, or they, it, where, as you said, it, it multiplies the state investment and helps kind of move it into places that have not had the same kind of, uh, have not had the investment opportunities in the energy transition, the clean energy climate transition that, that we need to see. So um, I, the question is, does it take personal investment? then the short answer is no. This is about no. helping institutional investors or project financing. So it's not an individual bank. Yep, you're not gonna make deposits into this individually. There may be ways to do something similar to that. I'm not expert enough to speak to it. 
but okay. it's better to think about it in terms of not proximity. Awesome. Well, we are three minutes away from finishing up and I we made it through all of our panelists. I wanna give them a virtual round of applause. Um, I learned a lot tonight um, about the overall landscape and about specific places that we are set up to make real investment, state investment and real public investment in our collective futures. And I'm, I'm excited about the potential and there's work we need to do in the last few weeks of session to make sure that money is going in the places that um, we see as important for building building our collective future. And particularly tonight, we're focused on, on clean energy and, and climate resilience uh, and the energy transition. So I am going to send a follow-up out. I'm going to write up a blog post and send a follow-up with all the info, like kind of summarizing the conversation we heard here tonight and giving you um, some uh, some ways to take action and would love for you to, to check that out um, yourself and share it around and um, go to these websites and um, take advantage of the really amazing advocacy landscape um, to help, you know, it's really hard as an individual. It's like, actually I would say impossible as an individual to follow everything that's happening at the legislature and know how to effectively insert your voice into, into shaping the future we're creating. And so what we're trying to do tonight is really help you understand where things are and, and how to take some actions that will help move us towards the future where we're wanting to, to create in this key moment of a really what's shaping up to be a historic legislative session. So Thank you all for taking the time on an absolutely gorgeous April night that we have been waiting for and um, look forward to connecting with you virtually or in person soon. Thanks so much, everyone. And especially thanks to the panelists for taking the time. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Janet. Bye, y'all. Thanks Bye. so much. And Aurora's much too humble. She does I so much. I agree. <laughs> I see her everywhere. So thanks, Aurora, for all you do. Bye, everyone. I appreciate that, Janet. Thank you. You're so welcome. Take care. Bye. Um, awesome. Thanks, Aurora. Thanks, Ashley. Thank Dad, you. Kate. I'll see you tomorrow. I think. It's I don't know. Rest. I will. I'm okay. going to go say goodnight to my daughter before she goes to bed. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Good, good job, night. Kate. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.